Live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll, broadcasting and video streaming live from our studios in New York City, and I'd like to welcome you. Today, we're going to find out how magnesium is your most important mineral for bone health, not calcium, and also how cacao or raw chocolate is good for metabolic syndrome. We're also going to look at how it can protect us against high blood pressure and how millennials, many of are eating healthy and less likely to choose opiates to manage pain. And also autism. Now we know that autism can be helped using a natural diet and supplementation. Well, adding to that, it's just one nutrient has been shown to make a big difference in autistic children. I'll share that and a lot more on health and healing. Then I'm going to spend a little extra time today without a guest talking about some of the lessons we can learn from the hurricane that just devastated the Houston and Galveston and uh, areas of, of Texas and also over into Louisiana. And now we have a new one coming, and this one may be even worse. We don't know yet whether it'll hit the east coast, the west coast of uh, Florida, up the Gulf, and we'll know probably in the next three or four days. But we should be planning on a worst-case scenario. If we do, then at least we can mitigate some of this damage that's going to be done. Also today, we have a lot of, a lot of damage done to the national psyche right now. And I want to share some thoughts from Nietzsche and also a commentary from Chris Hedges called Diseases of Despair that goes into this in some depth. I'm also going to talk about the things you don't see when you have a flood going on and people are scrambling to stay alive or others are scrambling to help those in need. What's the underlying story that's not being reported? I'll share that. Also, there are certain places in the world, according to the newest study, that are simply not going to be habitable major areas. I have the list, and this is the list of the world's most water-stressed nations, and they're basing it on what is called a 5.0 baseline, and that's the worst. So will food shortages come to these areas? Yes. So where's the United States ranking here? You'll be surprised. But I want people to know that historically there were some countries that people thought would be great to live in, and indeed, for a period of time, they were. Not today. Not in your future. Even in the United States, I remember a friend of mine four years ago saying that one of the most beautiful places in America was the Great Plains of Montana. I cautioned him. I said, Montana's finding itself getting drier and drier. So what would happen if you had fires? All there's never been any major fires out there. I've done my homework. I said, you sure? And there's someone that we both knew who bought a home in New Mexico. And indeed, it was a beautiful environment out in the woods where he was. And I said, make sure you do your hydrology studies. He didn't. Later, nine years later, everything would come to an end out there because there was no water. One day, it went from brown to breakish to non-existent. All the water was gone, and there was no place to draw water from. So he had to walk away from a house that at one time had just been beautiful. Now it was deserted. We're going to see a lot of this. Oh, and by the way, the worst wildfires in Montana history are occurring right now, and they're zero contained. Oh, and the worst fires in Los Angeles history, according to the mayor, 7,000 acres are occurring right now. I've been posting photos of these over the last three days on my personal Facebook, where I post about 100 articles a day and photos to show you what's happening around the world, because we wouldn't necessarily know this. So we're going to deal with this today. Also, here's something you may not be aware of. Which country is building more echo cities to withstand the ravages of the environment? 
which are the most ecologically friendly. I'll deal with that, and it'll surprise you. And today, it's rare that you have a former president of a country give advice on the Internet to a present president of a country. But the former president of Mexico has sent a message to Donald Trump. I'm going to play it today. I think you'll find it interesting. Oh, and you know all those people who are saying how bad our immigration policies are? Well, for many reasons, they are not. They're not good. They're not humane, and they're not practical. But one of the people leading the charge out there of attacking is Barack Obama. So I found, I found a, a statement by Barack Obama in his own words. You'll hear him. And why isn't this being used to judge this person? So we'll talk about that. So we have a lot to share. Let's begin. There's a good study. It's called, it's about sales programming to become younger. And I've collected about maybe a hundred different studies on this one study. And here's what it says. It says, in a study published in the journal Cell, Researchers describe a process whereby reprogramming cells to a younger state can reverse aspects of aging. Quote, by inducing the expression of four genes known as the Yamayaka factors, any cell, that means anyone in your body, can become a pluripotent stem cell which in lay language means it's similar to an embryonic uh, stem cell. So it's therefore capable, as all these are, of dividing without limit and becoming any cell type. In effect, you could grow a new brain cell, new eye cell, new heart cell. Just imagine what that would do for all the people suffering from disease. Now, though these, they're, they're, keep in mind, there's a danger in unchecked cell growth like cancer. But the potential of anti-aging benefits for humans is astounding. So I will do more on this. I remember I did not have the benefit of the science they had. I was, in effect, doing uh, basic and applied research simultaneously, meaning I had no pattern to follow that anyone else had laid down. And I couldn't get even get funding or permission to do this through the institute where I was a research fellow in anti-aging medicine. And so on my own, I just went out and bought the supplies and I tried this experiment. Taking only what I knew at the time that life is measured by its vitalism scale. What do I mean? There are people throughout history. Spinoza was one. Voltaire was one. Maimonides was one certainly Socrates. These were vitalists. These are people who looked at life as a vital energy to which you could then express yourself in helping to enhance the energy of all life. We don't talk about this today. It's a forgotten philosophy. Or it was considered so esoteric no one gave it any credence. Now, by doing a series of experiments, over 14 separate experiments over a five-year period, starting off with humans, including Dr. Dolores Krieger, head of nursing at NYU. And from that study, Therapeutic Touch was created. It's now taught in every nursing school in America. Dr. Thomas Kruth, Rabbi Abraham Wiseman, and he was known in the Jewish community, especially the Orthodox Jewish community, for his capacity to do unusual healings. There was Dr. Um, Morton Jacobs, and he was known as the man who could had energy and power in his hands. And also Olga Worrell and, and others. And over out of 50 people, these individuals over a period of two years were able to repeatedly take cancerous ascites tumor mice and reverse it. There are photographs of this, them actually holding the mice and, and description of this up on my website under the old photographs. And so that created a template. The template was this, that if any th anyone has the capacity to exchange, to channel, alter, or in some method, 
to have an energy that originates or passes through them goes into another person or creature or plant, then you've proven that energy can be transferred. So you prove the hypothesis. It's like you could have 10,000 people try to run a four-minute mile and not do it. Bannister did it. So you then reset the entire gauge of went from possibility to doable. But then, and this is a little difficult for some people to appreciate or understand, depending upon their limits of perception. Nature never provides us with half answers, which means that if something is able to heal, then everything has the same potential to be a vehicle for healing. So that means that not all humans can heal. But those who can, why are they able to? I have found that people who block their own energy and are just living through conditioned response energy, their subconscious reactive energy, I've never seen them heal anything. But people who get into that enlightened state, that cathartic state, that epiphany, where you're fully conscious, which most people only spend maybe 2 to 3% of their entire lives in, that little tiny space where we see things in the true light of universal truths, they are what they are, and we're not stressed by them, it flows effortlessly. Well, those are the people who are able to manifest this. It's just like not everybody has the it factor. You know, everybody can dress up like Michael Jackson or Elvis, but boy, don't, don't for a second think that what they're trying to do, they're giving you the energy of the real McCoy. And we see this, that some people have that it, others don't. <clears throat> that will also mean that food, water, juices also have a healing factor. But science stopped at caloric measurement and didn't look for vital life movement. So if you have a piece of meat, it's dead energy. There's no vitalism. Whereas if you have an apple, it has energy, it's vitalism. Now, if you fed sugar and alcohol and french fries and meat to an animal, it's going to kill it. In fact, I actually did the experiment. To my knowledge, the only time it's ever been done, ever, where I gave a doctor's diet. And out of humanitarian reasons, because I do not believe in vivisection, I do not believe in cruelty to animals or in ever sacrificing an animal. I've never even uh, euthanized an animal. That meant that when I saw the animals getting worse and getting the same diseases that humans would, I had to stop that and then reverse their disease get them back their health and vitality by shifting over to what I called the vitalism diet. The vitalism diet, which I've never talked about, <clears throat> I've never you know, promoted it, was where the only food or beverages given were at the highest level of energy vibration. <clears throat> Excuse me. These were raw foods, sprouts, juices, fresh made, wheatgrass juice, etc., and this is where animals not only lived a long life, they thrived, and they broke all the measurements at that time for how long an animal could live because the control group lived its normal life eating standard rat chow. It became so difficult to convince anyone of the legitimacy of this study that the entire scientific group that, heard the, uh, that listens every month to the different progress being made refused to accept that was possible. Why? They, their perception said that the diet is not important. Diet doesn't cause disease. Diet doesn't cure disease. So saying that you were able to lengthen the lifespan of rats by 30 or 40 percent by this kind of diet you're talking about, it's just nonsense. So after months of arguing the issue, the director of the institute had me redo the entire experiment for almost two years where it was monitored. Every single thing was monitored. Again, I did it. Again, the same results. Again, extending the life. This time, they accepted that what I did was legitimate scientifically. They refused to promote it. In fact, <clears throat> I was not even allowed to send out an article on this because they said it would upset a lot of the dietitians who are providers of death for a lot of people. And I am a registered dietitian. <clears throat> and I remember what people were taught in dietetic schools, and it's the worst dietary information imaginable. 
So just imagine coming up with a new paradigm where you can change the lifespan, change the quality of life, and change the nature of understanding how the biodynamics of the body works, and it's completely and utterly rejected. So that's where you have to then figure out another way of presenting this. So now, that research done in the 1970s, almost 40 years ago, is now showing up in Cell Magazine. So now, 40 years late, they finally are getting part of it right. What they are not doing in this article is seeing the role that the mind, behavior, beliefs, and spirituality play in that rejuvenation and longevity process. For those of you who are coming down to the retreat, I'm going for the month, I'm going to be dealing with this every single day because I'm determined at this point to finally give as much information as possible to people to re- make them realize that everything you put into your mind, your belief systems, your perceptional, your perceptional view, your, your diet, all matter. Yesterday on the street, I'm walking up the street now. A man and wife stop me and say hello. And we start chatting. And the wife says, you know, he's got this problem, that problem, this problem, that problem. Nothing works. <clears throat> so I said, what, what do you feel is the problem? And he tried to explain it to me. He's an architect, so he was explaining it as an architect, as that linear left brain, reductionist. So I said, well, if you have a knowledge of eating healthily, and being happy, have you applied that? And he said, no. And I said, so it's not a, it's not a communication problem that you're having with yourself. It's a perception problem you've got with yourself. And then we had a whole half hour conversation on the street about our country is bereft with perceptional dysfunction syndrome. It's just a a simple um, analysis that lets us know that we may have the right intent and the right desire and the right the right support system to make the changes we need to live a long and healthy life. It does not then state that because we have this support and these tools that we use them. Every day of my life, I see people, terminally ill people, seven days a week, every day of the year for decades. Not one single human being that's ever come to see me in my entire career chose alternative health and practice first. It was only after everything else failed, when they tried everything orthodoxy and their family and their doctors suggested, then and only then when they were said, there's nothing more we can do, here's some opiates, go into hospice care. Then and only then they, they said, well, well, maybe better try something else. Even that in and of itself does not change a person's perception. A heart attack, bankruptcy, this flood in Houston will cause no change whatsoever. None. Zero. Not a scintilla will happen positively because of any of this. We will focus our efforts on communicating the gallantry of those who came to the rescue, but not ever talking about who these people are. Those who were victims, not talking about how were they in a place to be victimized. How, how did they end up? How come you didn't see any of the rich and the super rich or their children or family in those boats or going back into a house that was flooded? Because they were in an area that was elevated that wasn't flooded or they were in the buildings or they were out of there. So we never had the deeper conversation. We stop at the level that we can justify our perceptional biases our prejudices. We blame it on the storm and the lack of circumstances allow a person to get out of the harm's way. That doesn't work because we did that with Sandy. We did it with Katrina. We've done it our whole history and we'll do it next week. If I tell people right now, you've, you're going to, if you're in the storm's way, the storm will win, you will lose. What do you want to bet that not 1% of the people will really prepare? But they'll be out there talking about how they're going to rebuild. That's a perceptional problem. And our perception becomes our reality. Then your reality doesn't change, which means we don't change. We want to. We have the tools to. 
But you've got to change your perception if you're ever going to change your reality. You can't change your reality if you don't change your perception. It's not possible. Yet we put all of our energy into protecting our perception, who we are. We are a remarkable nation. In some respects, absolutely, I agree with that. But in some respects, our remarkableism means that we're remarkable at dropping the first atomic bomb. And the only people in history to ever use nuclear weapons on civilians, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and depleted uranium over millions of people, and causing a completely viable nation that represented no threat, hadn't invaded any country, hadn't harbored any terrorist, Libya to be destroyed. That takes remarkable hubris and perceptional denialism, manifesting and embracing a manifest destiny of major distortions of the human spirit. And that's everyone, not just a few people. The entire nation did it. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Anderson Cooper and those dancing clowns at CNN, the president of the United States, the previous president of the United States, the president before that, all presidents of the United States have been more mongers. And yet we don't, we don't hold them accountable for anything. Genocide is now being waged in Yemen. We will not hold anyone accountable. So if we can't be honest about what is not exceptional, if we cannot change our perception to change the reality to deal with the real world and real issues and real problems to create real solutions, then how are we going to get out of a storm's way when it comes? We won't. So how are we going to de-age when we're not willing to acknowledge that what we're putting into our body, our mind, and our values prematurely ages us? Hence, we won't. But you will see at some point, I'm sure, an infomercial on television offering you either uh, your largest erection, your greatest orgasm, or an extra three years of life. If you just call this number immediately, and if you do it within the next three minutes, they'll throw in a second orgasm and an extra two days of life. And people would just line up for that. That's what happens when you suffer from perception dysfunction disorder. But for those of you who are open to changing your perception, for those of you, it was probably 5%, which is still a lot of people, which keeps me an optimist, then understand there is no such thing as undoing the damage that we do Whatever damage we do, we have to compensate. But the process of compensating for the damage we've done then stresses the system so the system becomes duality, meaning you're doing something good on the left hand and something bad on the right hand. And you wonder why you're getting older, looking older, diseasing, losing memory. Well, because you're doing two things simultaneously and they are inherently contradictory. You, you can't be filled with love and hate simultaneously. You can't be filled with creative, uh, creative capacity and destructive capacity simultaneously. You can't be doing something healthy and sick simultaneously. You're doing one or the other, and one will always have a consequence to the other. So what would happen if you chose as of today to have the discipline to no longer ever again put stuff in your f face that you shouldn't? I just – someone just was waiting outside the studio and uh, – a person has had five strokes and yet won't change their diet. Five strokes. What does it take then? What communication does a person have to have? What reality do they have to face to realize that you can't do them both? You can't have a junk food diet and be healthy. The stroke is what the outcome of a bad diet is. Side effects from all the medications we're taking that most we don't need is the outcome of what means when we don't have a health care system. We have a disease maintenance and profiteering system. So we've got to have a big eraser, just wipe our mind clean of everything that we think that we know and realize almost everything we believe in, every ritual we honor, every person that we acquiesce authority to, over our lives to isn't any better than we are in our worst moment. So we've got to reclaim the right to make proper choices. 
But the good news is they're finally validating what we have known for years and many of you have benefited. Some of you are alive and well today because you've made good choices. You didn't have to wait till a peer-reviewed journal published the results. Good for you, using common sense and reason. Also, magnesium and chromium fight insulin resistance. This was medical college, and it says magnesium and chromium. Magnesium, let's say, 800 milligrams a day, and chromium, 200 micrograms a day, made an enormous difference in uh, insulin. Well, if you have insulin resistance, you're going to be far more susceptible to type 2 diabetes. So take your magnesium, take your chromium each day. Also, for any children with autism, there's a whole lot you can do for autistic children to bring them back to a semblance of quality of life and even reverse it completely. The fact that we have reversed autism 100% shows it can be done. But it can't be done haphazardly. You've got to do it all. But here's one thing that everyone who has someone with autism can do. This was published in the Journal of uh, Children's Physiology and Psychology, Psychiatry. It says, autistic children benefit from vitamin D3. Okay. This was a randomized, controlled study and of children with autism spectrum disorder. Quote, this study is the first double-blind randomized controlled trial proving the efficacy of vitamin D3 in autism spectrum disorder. So you want to help your kid with autism? Vitamin D3 each day. And also a new study showed that cacao, which is chocolate, and this was done at Brigham and Young University, can protect against diabetes. And that's good. And it doesn't take a lot, about two ounces a day, substantially protected the cells and decreased oxidative stress negative effects. So, and it was epicatechin monomers. Those are the chemicals uh, that are making the mitochondria and the beta cells stronger. And chocolate was a major part of helping that. So, have your chocolate have healthier cells, healthier heart, less likely to develop a stroke. That's the latest on health and nutrition and longevity. I'm Gary Nall, broadcasting from our studios in New York City. We're going to take a break and come back, and then I'm going to... Here are some of the countries, this is the best statistics I can find, that will not be sustainable in the very near future. And this is based upon the worst case scenario. At the top of the list, Saudi Arabia. Interesting because Saudi Arabia is now doing a fire sale of trying to raise hundreds of billions of dollars by privatizing everything in their country. There's a couple reasons for this. One, because the current head of Saudi Arabia an absolute monarchy, does not allow any other religion outside of Wahhabism and throws gays off buildings and beats women. Nobody has rights. You can't assemble. So it's, it's probably the worst country in the world to live in if you appreciate freedoms of any kind. But they have spent hundreds of billions of dollars in the war in Yemen which we have uh, facilitated that by sh selling them over $100 billion worth of weapons and then giving them the use of our satellites and intelligence and actually have boots on the ground in Yemen, the poorest country in the Middle East. And yet the poorest country in the Middle East has still not been destroyed. They've tried. They've destroyed all the hospitals and, and uh, schools. And thousands of innocent civilians have been killed. They have the largest cholera epidemic in the world right now, starvation of at least 7 million people. This is genocide. And yet you don't see a word about this in the United States media. 
<clears throat> and certainly nothing being discussed by the State Department or the White House. Under Obama and Clinton or under, under Trump. But why would they be suddenly open to privatizing everything? Because they're now actually having to borrow money. They at one time had $900 billion in reserve currency. Now it's way down. They also have not been able to, <clears throat> um, to maximize their profit on oil since it's selling about $50 a barrel and takes $75 a barrel in processing to get it to market. So they're losing $25 a barrel on every barrel of oil they produce every day. How long can you take that loss up? Well, it's a long time, and it doesn't look like it's going to change. Also, many people believe that they're already past peak oil, so they're trying to get other income from other sources to diversify their portfolio. Otherwise, up to this point, it was just 100% oil. So they're making major changes, but right now, no matter what happens, they're running out of water, and they do not have the money to sustain themselves in a completely hot climate, because as hot as it is, it's going to get hotter there. All the Gulf states, now these are all corrupt little regimes, the United Arab Emirates, and that was stupid enough to actually spend a trillion dollars on Dubai at sea level. And just think of the suckers. Think of the people that bought homes thinking that it would just be the Wall Street of the Middle East. And no one asked these German and Swiss and very bright engineers and architects, you're building the highest, tallest building in the world. You're building all this fan island with thousands of homes. You're building the only eight-star hotel in the world, but you're building it at sea level. Is there any chance that the sea is going to rise? No, none. Sorry, all of Dubai now is being impacted because of this. And the people have lost their fortunes because those homes that were on those islands are cracking, breaking, and there's nothing, no way to, to save that. So then Abu Dhabi's head, that is really the most powerful person within because he has oil, Dubai was just a Bedouin village that had no oil, came in and took over from his cousin and now runs it. And so it's just a money drain. But now they're running out of water. In Kuwait, Yemen, Oman, Jordan, Libya, Palestine, Israel, and uh, Kyrgyzstan. Now, just below that, now these are places you're simply not going to be able to live in the future. Below that is Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Mongolia, India, Australia, Spain, Portugal, and Mexico. And below that is the United States and then Canada. So 20 states in the United States are getting so dry that there will be no way to sustain anything in the future. So that's what we're facing right now. So we are having some problems with water. And I'm suggesting that at least don't be moving to places where the future is going to be dust storms, sandstorms, fires. Just look at the United States today. Look at the West today. Look at the water crisis. Right now, there's six million people in Texas that don't have water. Six million don't have clean drinking water. That's just horrendous. Back in a moment with a commentary. Please stay with us. Nice to have you back, everyone. Loved Jerry Butler. Loved, uh, uh, I think he was one of the finest singers ever, but that wasn't Jerry Butler. Who was that? Jackie Wilson. I'm going to do a documentary. It's one of my little pet projects. By the way, tomorrow I'm going to tell you about a documentary, three documentaries I'm going to do next year and for three months. And I'm going to be on the road for three months. I'm out, out, out completely designing an a RV so I can do my radio show every day. I can counsel people from it, but also I have my whole film crew there. And then I'm going to invite some of the people, just five people who'd like to see what it's like. 
where I'm going to take on the most ambitious project I've ever done. And it'll be fun. It'll be interesting. I'll tell you what that project is tomorrow. In any case, tomorrow night, we have a dance party. For all of you who uh, have been supporting our sister station, WBI in New York, through thick and thin, and uh, you're there whenever it needs money, this is just my way of saying, on behalf of the station, thank you. I rented a place. It's free to you. It's free to the station. And I haven't done one in three years. It's tomorrow evening from 7 to 10. I've selected music. I'm mixing the music. And uh, come to dance. Come to celebrate life. Meet new people. So it's a wonderful opportunity. But you've got to call and make a reservation. You can only make, only make a reservation for yourself. And hopefully you, you, you haven't forgotten how to dance because we're going to do some dancing. Call 646-926-5422, 646-926-5422 for our dance party tomorrow. And then tomorrow I'll tell you about, even by the standards of what I like to take on, I've never taken on anything as challenging as what I'm going to be filming next, uh, next June, July, and August. So, but a lot of people say, oh, I hear that you're out filming here and filming there and it sounds interesting. Well, it could be, um, depending upon your interest. But if you want to see something really interesting, this is. I'll explain it tomorrow. <clears throat> when you look at the people who are out there without question doing amazing work on helping people survive, going back and loading up their boats with dogs, cats, helping to get on a horse and go in and get the other horses that are in that water and developing diseases because the chemicals in the water out. You might take a closer look at who those people are. Who are they? The majority of those people are people we'd call rednecks. And unfortunately, because of our perceptional disorder, dysfunctional disorder, we're perceiving anyone who is considered a redneck as deplorable or people that should not be considered of value as a human being because we all know, don't we, that every redneck is a racist, is a Nazi or Nazi sympathizer, is, and then you run down the litany of all the things we've been told these people are. There's only one problem. It's not true. I grew up in West Virginia, hillbilly country. In fact, if you want to know why we had Labor Day, why don't you go back and look at the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the labor movement in West Virginia and the strikes in the mines, even before John L. Lewis, and how they sent in the National Guard to kill these people. These were hill people. When you live in Wheeling, West Virginia, Weirton, West Virginia, Parkersburg, West Virginia, went to high school, college there, first college graduated from, you get to know the people. And you get to know that these are people, by and large, are just decent, ethical people who you'd never have to ask them for help. They would be the first to volunteer. And yet, instead of showing what it means to be just a regular person, we've made this unique, divisive uh, statistic. If you're educated, if you're white or a person of color, educated and successful, you're excluded from being challenged on what you do, how you do it, how you make your money. Was there any suffering or degradation or exploitation because of how you did this? And are these the people showing up to demonstrate on behalf of others of their own race or their own cultural background who have not been able to overcome inequality? Because I've been in an awful lot of demonstrations. I've led a lot of demonstrations. I've created home movements. So it's not like a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand people that I've been with. So I can tell you, I don't find a lot of those people who run corporate America. I don't see a lot of those people who are the leading intellects, with some exceptions, and I mean some. I don't see those people who are in the upper management areas of life, who are comfortable, who are safe financially. We have 10 million millionaires, and we have 17.7 .7 million professional class. 
together with full family, it's 100 million people. So if you've got 100 million people who can afford just about anything, and the ones who can't afford it will still pretend they can and create debt by it, but they're living at a standard as if they were all rich, their kids were all rich. Who do you think is flooding all these Ivy League schools with the vast majority? These are these two groups. Where do you find these groups helping a society, helping the poor, helping the neighbors, helping those who are distressed? With rare exception, you don't. So they're they're set off to the side. So then who's actually out there in the boats? Who's actually out there helping? It's the people that most people think something's wrong with them. Yet there's a lot wrong, but not with them. What's wrong is how they've been treated, how they've been viewed. Did you ask yourself... While we were having over a million people adversely affected by this hurricane in Texas and Louisiana, there were 40 million made homeless and adversely affected in Southeast Asia and India. They had more die in one day than we had in the whole time, not a word. And when a state is not important or it's not in the news cycle, we don't hear that they've had the worst fires in the state's history burning vast amounts of for it. We don't hear it. Not important. Have a fire in a rich person's neighborhood in Beverly Hills where you have some celebrities, and suddenly that leads the news cycle. So my question is this. If you have not taken the time and the effort to speak with people that you would condemn, what does that say about your value system rather than the people you're condemning? It's easy to condemn the ones who stand front and center and say, they're Nazi or racist. or We all see those people, and we know what they are, and we're disgusted by this type of behavior and attitude. But when you suddenly make all Americans equally at risk of being judged because of their economic status where they live or what you don't know about their background, then you miss all those people who just like a job. And when Reagan promised them a job but shipped out jobs, he's the one who opened the door. And he's the one who promoted equity buyouts and corporate rating and downsizing. And then Bush Sr., Bush Jr., Clinton, Obama, all betrayed the American public. These are the people they betrayed. And all the others who became millionaires, billionaires, those are the people that they supported. So what happens when you don't care about Democrat or Republican? You could, probably couldn't find Russia on a map. You don't listen to Mr. Peters and these other people on Fox News who blather on about why Russia is the greatest danger in the world. It isn't. Or we should all fear being invaded by Iran. We won't be. And why we had to kill, you know, uh, Gaddafi and why we should kill Assad in Syria, we shouldn't and shouldn't have. And why everything we've done in foreign policy has been wrong. The people who don't know any of this just want to have a day with less pain, more happiness, with the simplest things in life. And for that, they are condemned. So maybe it's time for some introspection. But to get to that introspective moment, we're going to have to do a lot more soul searching. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about what happens when despair becomes a disease and the way we look at the helplessness and hopelessness of our predicament and how that can lead to suicide and opiate use and alcohol use and prescription medication use. So we look at the end stage of that and we penalize it, punish it. We deplore it and therefore we want that person who's taken the drugs in prison because they're a threat to the rest of stability of society, but they're not. Why don't you ask the person who takes the drugs, why did you take the drugs? And the person who's obese, why do you keep eating? And the person that is living in front of a television set, why are you doing this? Are we afraid of the answers? Would it be too much truth too soon to a society that lives through illusion? That I'll discuss tomorrow. Now I want to show you what is possible. We have our sister station, WBA in New York, and it is, it is in need of help. I had hoped that two weeks ago with the premier, and by the way, thank you all for showing up, 
uh, we originally had agreed that every penny of that would go to not only pay for the premiums of my show, but also the other programs, the other producers. It just didn't turn out that way. That's unfortunate. Nothing I can do about that. But I still have people who haven't gotten their premiums. Last week, however, we were able to get about 400 premiums paid for. This week, my goal is to get the rest of the premiums paid for for the spring drive. <clears throat> so everybody is made whole, at least everybody that we're aware of. What started out as, as a few experimental developments to test new green urban design and technological systems has turned into an all-out movement. Echo cities are now being built across China, from the eastern seaboard to the fringes of Central Asia, from the inner Mongolia to the jungles in the hinterlands of the south. Eighty percent of all of the level cities now in existence are said to have at least one Echo City project in the works. And then it goes on to talk about what these Echo Cities will be. They're going to have solar powered and wind powered. They're going to have uh, geothermal. Uh, they'll have wave power. And also they're going to um, be having a ways that, excuse me, they'll be having ways that the cities can uh, withstand storms. And uh, they're going to be treating uh, water and waste in ways they have not historically done. Because on the other hand, China was so interested in massive 10, 12, 13 percent gross domestic product development every year that they didn't even consider the cost to the environment. And hence, they had the greatest desertification of any city in history. All around, uh, China is losing up to 12,000 towns, communities, and cities per year. The desert is taking it back. All the water in China is polluted. All the rivers are polluted. They're not even allowing the citizens to use the water to irrigate. That's how polluted it is. So a, a million people a year die in one part of China where they use uh, coal to, as their primary fuel. And burning coal inside is extremely toxic. So China is going from the most polluting country in the world to the leading with the most cities. Eight, uh, keep in mind, when, when you have that many cities, almost 300 cities that you're building, whole cities, and China doesn't build little, little cities. You're talking about a city that might hold 10 million people, larger than Manhattan, uh, all based upon ecology. Also, it is doing the new Silk Road over 2,000 miles where they're building ports and communities and factories and farms, they're putting upwards what will be at least $2 trillion in with over 67 countries right now in these positive ways of building up the local economy, of which China will be a major recipient of its uh, benefits. So look at that. They're helping countries. They're helping people. They're putting people to work. They're increasing their standard of living for these people. And at the same time, we're spending the same amount of money with 900 military bases to bring fear and terror and exporting our, our nihilistic, neoliberalist policies. We're just on the wrong side of right when it comes to understanding the consequence of this. Also from Houston, this is uh, from Highlands, Texas, um, and it says... Toxic waste sites flooded in Houston area. And it goes on to talk about how the super fun sites, which have not been cleaned up, this is what the EPA has said are the most dangerous toxic reservoirs of chemicals in America. They're now flooded. And so those floods are carrying all that debris over the water, through the water, into the soil. There's no way you're going to be able to get any of that out. Plus, it also shows in here, so that's the super sites. Then it talks about how uh, there is the lobbyists are now in Washington uh, trying to make sure the insurance company's interests are protected by denying people insurance, flood insurance. And 80% of all the people that you see, they have no flood insurance. They can't rebuild. And then those that rented, Landlords are demanding rent. Oh, by the way, let them check the law in Texas. If your landlord demands you pay rent, and if you can show that a, the habitat you were using is no longer habitable because a natural disaster, nothing you've done, then the law down there is on your side, not the landlord's. 
So become educated on the law so you're not exploited. And now the insurance companies that are going to be giving the largest payout in history, because right now the damage is looking at about $180 billion, and the government already has our Katrina and Sandy program that's $25 billion in debt. So the federal government's troubled uh, flood insurance program is not going to pay for this. So we're going to end up with massive litigation, but in the process, it's going to take several years, and people are going to be living without a home and can't go back in because the water damage and the molds from the one they have and can't plant anything in their backyard because the soil is going to be so polluted and the air is polluted. Over one million pounds of toxic chemicals were spewing out of those refineries during this storm. So we should have an honest, thorough look at everything in this environment, and you'll see that it's non-inhabitable. So we should be making plans of how to help people move to environments that are sustainable for the future. We're out of time. I'm Gary Nall. Thank you all for listening. Look forward to sharing more tomorrow. Have a nice day.